Hi everyone, my name is Moni. And I'm Naveen from Before You Play. And today, we are embarking on our Top 50 journey, finally. Yes, right? yes, this is something that we've wanted to do for a while, and uh, no better time of year than now, towards the end of the year, where we can discuss all the different games that are in our unique Top 50 list. Yes. There may be some crossovers, obviously, because we share a collection. A lot. Uh, but <laughs> uh, they will most likely be completely out of order. Yes, and so we are extra excited about this because this month we are going to be doing it in the form of five different videos, uh, 10 games each, essentially. And mm -hmm. so today we are starting with 41 through 50. Yep. And each video we will be hosting a giveaway that is sponsored by a publisher whose game is on our list. Mm -hmm. And so we do have a few things that we want to discuss before we get into our list, namely our methods and disclosures. Yep. And so the first thing is first, we made our lists prior to getting in touch with the publishers. And so the games that we are going to be giving away have always been on our top 50 lists, not the other way around. Right, right. Um, in addition, some of the games on our list may have been games that we we may have been sponsored to do a playthrough for, either on our own channel or on Watch It Played. And so whenever we get to those, we'll make sure to disclose those as much as possible. But uh, we tried to keep our lists as honest as possible. Yeah. In terms of the giveaway, we are going to be announcing what game or games we're going to be giving away at the end of each video. And so make sure to stay tuned to the very end if you're interested. Now, I do want to mention that uh, the games, for the most part, are going to be shipped directly from the publishers, which means the countries or just regions that they can ship to will vary. Mm -hmm. And so if you are not based in the United States, make sure to check the link in the description for the actual giveaway to see which countries are unfortunately have to, going to have to be excluded. Right. With that being said, all of the details of the giveaway, each video are going to be linked in the description below. They will last typically about five days, mm -hmm. uh, with the exception of maybe the very last one, sure. which might be faster. Mm -hmm. But um, that's pretty much it in terms of that. So how exactly did we arrive at our top 50? Uh, what was the method that we used? So we used a, gener a website that's called Pub Meeple, which basically you can generate different lists. And essentially what you do is you upload you know, pretty much as many games as, as you want to, uh, and there's basically a 1v1 pairing where mm -hmm. it will be uh, game A versus game B. And you basically have to make a decision and you constantly do this. And it, the, the engine basically figures out for you, you know, your top 50 based off of that. Mm -hmm. After we got that kind of top 50 spit out to us, we went back and then looked at our list and then really said, okay, does that one really is more favorable to me than the other one? And then we right. kind of tinkered and yeah. moved things around at that point. Yeah, we, we kind of did like a final edit. Yeah. Uh, in terms of Pub Meeple, by the way, they're not just a top what number 50 mm -hmm. generator. They're also, I believe they have like a podcast mm -hmm. and some other things. And so we're going to include a link to just their website down below, just, just so you can all check them out. We were notified about Pub Meeple in the first place by a podcast of our, our friends over at Board Game Barrage, who are also doing their top 50. So please go ahead and check them out. I believe they do theirs every year or mm -hmm. something, and it's highly entertaining. Yeah. So definitely check them out this month while they do their top 50. And so when actually going to decide which games are, are going head to head, uh, I don't know about you, but the way that I did it was based off of an ideal game night. Like you are neutral mm -hmm. mood, uh, you have the, the perfect number of players for each of these games. Yeah. Which one would you prefer to play? Or which one would you choose nine times out of ten, I guess? Yeah. The That's how I did mine. Right. Yeah, I kind of did something very similar. So we didn't talk about this ahead of time. But um, I did something very similar. Like, if it was this game versus this game, this game may have be the better game in terms mm -hmm. of design and all that stuff. And, like, kind of, like, the effort that went into producing that game. Right. Uh, but yes, exactly. Like right now, which game are you going to play? You know, like yeah. what, what can you easily get into or what, what would you want to get into? they invoke? Exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. so some games may be, you know, lighter. Some games may be heavier. Yeah. So, you know, there's a mix. There's a mix yeah. And I think that's it. Mm -hmm. I think we're ready to begin. Yep. And so, uh, you know, as we go through our list, you may see if you've been following um, our channel and watch some of our other top 10 lists, you will see some games from those lists mm -hmm. onto this one. But at least you'll know the the total ranking as to where we stand today. And so we've also excluded games that we've only played one time, right. which is unfortunate because there are a lot of games that we've only played once ever mm -hmm. that uh, we really, really wanted to include. But we felt like we just couldn't fully speak on them. Yes. You know, like we really enjoyed that one experience, but it just couldn't make it on the top list. But exactly. those are basically games that we'd love to revisit. So maybe we'll start with those. Since this time around, we did not include a um, an honorable mention. I know I had a few that I was debating. Can mm -hmm. we just mention them? Sure, yeah, okay. Okay, yeah. so starting with my uh, games that I wish I could have included in the list, but did not. Uh, for me, TI4. Yeah. Twilight Imperium 4th Edition is a game that I desperately wanted to put on my list because I really, really loved it. 
Um, I, we did not look these up, so I don't remember the designers or the publishers. Yeah. I deeply apologize, but that was a game that I've also only played one time. So maybe in the future, when we revisit this list, maybe you'll see it again. Yeah, TI4 would definitely be there for me. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed my one experience, but that was, what, three, four years ago now. Mm -hmm. And so I remember enjoying it, but mm -hmm. I don't remember it enough to speak on it and to definitely put it into a top 50 list. Yeah. Uh, another one for me is Bruges. Um, Bruges, mm -hmm. I played one time, a uh, three-player game, really enjoyed it. Uh, there's a new reprint that's coming out or has already come out. I'm not exactly sure where it is in the Kickstarter status. Uh, we picked it up recently at the local convention, uh, but I've not played it since we picked it up. Uh, but that's definitely one of those ones that's on my top 50. I'll do a second one. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, a second one for me would be Haunted Teutonica. Okay, yeah. Uh, we played that recently, and oh my god, I really loved it. Yeah, it's really but good. I just... I didn't think it was fair to include it on the list and then only just, played it like once. You, I right? think you've, you've actually played it a second time, but it was like remember. four or five years ago when yeah. we first got like deeper, deeper into the hobby. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that one, that one is uh, is up there. I don't know if it would be, make my top fifty, uh, so but good. It's, it's really it's good. So fun. Yeah. <laughs> okay, since you added a second one, the, the last one for me would be uh, Lorenzo Il Magnifico. So I really enjoyed that one. I played, and oh, I've never played actual physical copy. I've only played an online like a. Uh, TTS, or I can't remember exactly which the website. Uh, the website, yeah. yeah. And so we played that three player uh, with Daniel of the Game Table, if you're familiar with that. Um, and it's it's good. It's that's a really challenging game because uh, there's a lot of uh, competition for different areas and spots. Mm -hmm. uh, I really really enjoyed it. I would love to revisit that one as well. And I think there is a new reprint coming out, like a big box. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure when that is coming out, though. Ooh, mm -hmm. exciting. Okay, so with those out of the way, on to our uh, our number 50. Okay, you want to go first? Sure. Okay. Okay, so my, my first 10 here are going to be lighter games that I really enjoy taking to game night. Uh, and so that is what my number 50 is. This is a game that is designed by Ka Kali Malmyoka and uh, published by Renegade Games in 2016. And it's a card game called Honshu. So this game is really cute. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the theme of, of it is you're building, it's a map building game mm -hmm. where you're building out a town, um, I, I would assume in Honshu, yeah. which is in Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a trick taking mechanism to it. It's interesting because all of the cards have uh, different combinations of town features, mm -hmm. whether it's the actual town or um, a lake or there's the like forest. Little deserts, yeah. Right. And so the way that it works is each player has a hand of cards and each card is numbered. And so each round you play a trick of cards and uh, whoever wins the trick gets to choose which of the map cards to add to their actual map, yeah, to kind of build it out. From the cards everyone played, whoever played the highest number will get their first pick of mm -hmm. all those. So sometimes cards that have a low value have really good features on them. Mm -hmm. So then you have to use a card with high value to have pick of those lower value cards. Yes. But everybody's kind of over the course of the game is working towards different goals. Right. Uh, and so you never, know you never quite know what exactly need. what people exactly what people need. Yes. It's one of those games where each type of terrain scores differently. Uh, but when you do win a card, you place the card in your map and it has to kind of overlap with something. So sometimes you might be covering up something you really needed. Yes. Or it just has to be able to connect in your map in some way. Um, and so this is a really fun one that I really mm -hmm. enjoy bringing to, to game night as a, a starter or an ender, basically yeah. like the book ends of a game night. And uh, it's just never gotten old for me. I really, really love this game. There's also a drafting mechanism. So you kind of know what's out there uh, a little bit uh, before all the cards are being played. And uh, yeah, this one's really good. Mm -hmm. I think it plays up to five players. Yeah, it plays mm -hmm. up to five. And it's, it's only like a 30 minute game. Yeah. So it's real kind of easy to get into. There is an expansion, a standalone expansion to this called Hokkaido that Hokkaido. we also have. But we realize we we just don't like it more than this one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's one of those one of those times where the base game is just fine on its own, right? Spoiler: It's not on the top fifty. Yeah. So that is my number fifty, Hanshu. Yeah, that's a good one. I like that one a lot. Okay, my number 50, this is a game that is, it's also another little card game that plays three to five players. It is designed by Sergio Halaban, uh, published by White Goblin Games, and it was created back in 2016. And uh, this is the newer box version. This is a game called Matryoshka. And essentially what this is, this is a Russian nesting doll um, <laughs> collection game in <laughs> which there are these various uh, suits of, uh, it's basically a card game. Yeah. And essentially what you're doing is you're trying to collect different uh, combinations of nesting dolls of the same suit type and you want to get them all in the same sequence or you want to get the same valued nesting dolls of different suits so like yeah. if i want to get all the fives or maybe i want all the green ones right. and so what you're basically trying to do is there's a little bit of a negotiation aspect in this game oh, yeah. so time. you basically 
have a tableau of these cards laid out in front of you. So you can see what everybody is kind of gunning for. And so at the very beginning of your turn, you must negotiate and put something up for trade, meaning one of the cards in your in your hand, uh, you place out and you kind of entice other people to make deals with you saying, ooh, I really need that purple seven that Naveen's putting out there. And Monique might really want it. So I'm like, I know she wants this purple seven. So mm -hmm. here it is. Monique, give me a great deal because you know I need these greens, but if you don't give me a good deal, I'm going to give your sweet card away to somebody else for their sweet deal. It sounds ridiculous, yeah. <laughs> but that's it's essentially negotiation with Russian Nessie dolls. It, yes, exactly. Yeah. And so uh, at the very start of the game, you start out with only a few cards face up into your tableau. At the end of a round, you actually strip down all the cards and the cards that were once face up in your tableau, they don't have to be in your tableau anymore. They can now go back into your hand for later negotiation. And then at the start of a new round, you're going to lay out more cards face up. Kind of like a store display. Exactly, yeah. And it builds from round to round. And so essentially, uh, you're trying to curate these uh, a hand or a tableau where you're going to score the most points because you get points for having kind of a run of the same suit mm -hmm. or also the same type of numbers uh, kind of in, in, in a uh, vertical fashion. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's one of my favorite little games. Uh, perfect at four and five players. It's good at three players, but it's really nice to have that table talk. Uh, when you have a full complement. Yeah, it, the four and five player game is definitely where it's at. Um, now this game has been rethemed. Uh, there is a version out there. I don't, I don't know if it's by the same publisher. It might mm. not be. And it's uh, at, like cute cartoon animal themed. So that I had debated picking that up, but there's just something about the theme of this one that's yeah. so unique. Yeah, we really like it. Yeah, although it is a little bit difficult to see. I will say. Yeah, some of the uh, suits, yeah. very they kind of blend in. It kind of makes it, for, for me, it makes it a little bit more interesting that way because it's like, I think I need that. So you're really invested in looking at what other people have. But from an accessibility standpoint, yeah. that can be a little bit difficult. Mm -hmm. Yep, so that is my number 50. That is Matryoshka. All right, moving on to my 49. Uh, wow, it's amazing to think that we're going to be talking about 50, 50, <laughs> 50 yeah. games each. So my number 49 is a uh, technically a roll and write game. This is one of my favorite roll and write games of all time, clearly. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, designed by Hjal Hjalmar Hawk and Lorenzo Silva, uh, published by Horrible Guild or Simon. I think it's published by a few uh, companies in 2018. And it's a game called Railroad Inc. Mm -hmm. Now I'm holding two versions of the game because there are there were two versions of the game when it was first released. I think now there are two more versions. It's when a they, green and a yellow? Yeah, I they believe. did like an expansion for this. But we have just these two. It's mm -hmm. uh, the Deep Blue Edition and Blazing Red. Now, if you've never played these games before, we've actually covered it. And so we apologize for the kind of photo B-roll that we're going to use for some of these games. Yeah. It's just a, a screenshot, basically, of our <laughs> yeah. playthrough. But uh, if you're interested in playing along, we have done one. Uh -huh. um, and basically what you're doing here is each player has board, and there's dice, and you roll the dice, and it determines what kind of track that you have to draw on your board. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be either highway or railroad, mm -hmm. essentially. And uh, sometimes there are times where you can converge those two things and there are scoring conditions. I know I'm not doing a very good job explaining yeah, this. Yeah, you're trying to build out like kind of like a web of different track and streets mm -hmm. and, and you're trying to get to certain um, uh, kind of uh, exits and yes. you want to have as many kind of entrances and exits that are all connected to score the most amount of points in this right. game. Right. And so over the years, we've gone through uh, plenty of roll and write games because I really love that genre. Um, a lot of them have come and go, but these two have really stood the test of time for me. Mm -hmm. I can't get enough of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I know Naveen will disagree, yeah. but I really enjoy them. Uh, I, I, I do like these games. They're, they would not, um, spoiler, they're, they're not in my top 50. Uh, I do yeah. enjoy them. They are fun. They're easy to get into. They're very easy to teach. So this is a great starter for game night oh, or something yeah. like that. Or a good ender. Sometimes, you know, you play a really heavy game and you're like, everybody, I know that was intense. I know we're kind of at each other's throats, <laughs> but uh, who wants to play railroading just to kind of wrap it up before yeah. everybody takes off? So yeah, yeah. It, is, it is a good and a fascinating game. And it plays a lot of people. So if you have yeah, both, right. you can play like, with 12 or 13 people. Really. That's right, yeah, yeah. So. yeah. You're not limited technically by what's in the box as long as you have the sheets right. uh, from other people. And so that is my 49, Railroad Inc. Okay, so moving on, uh, my 49, this is a game that came out in 2015 and it's designed by Dan Kassar and published by Renegade Game Studios. 
and it is Arboretum. Now, this is not the green box version that we regretted giving away yeah, back in the day. Still don't have it. <laughs> uh, but we, we do have this game. And essentially what you're doing is you are trying to, once again, build, just like my last game, build out a tableau of different uh, tree varieties. And you're trying to also go in kind of ascending order, very similar to Matryoshka, now I think about it. Um, and you're trying to basically uh, score the most amount of points. The thing that's interesting about this game is there are different tree varieties. And mm -hmm. as you're trying species. to lay species, yeah, and as you're trying to lay them out, you're trying to score as many points as possible, but you only have the right to score them if at the very end of the game in your hand, you have the most value in that same trees that you had been playing out in your hand. Which so means you have to withhold. You have to withhold yeah. some of the cards that you know you would love to use to play out to score, but if you play them out, they're no longer in your hand, and somebody else can at the end of the game say, well, you know what, I have a level five of that card, and if I only have a level three, then I don't get the, the right to score them at all. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's very, very interesting. Everybody has their own discard pile also. So you can start taking cards from other people's uh, discard pile because essentially what you do in this game is I believe you... I believe you draw two cards. It's, that's right. It's, yeah, you draw, you draw two, two cards, cards. You play a card and discard Discard card. one card, yeah. So that discard can also be very strategic because if... If you play like I do, I like to discard cards that I actually need, that I don't think people will pick up That's until right. they actually do. Yes. <laughs> and then I'm ruined. <laughs> yeah, because everything's but... face up. So if it's like, oh, Monique's really hoarding those, uh, yeah. those, those purple trees. So I do not want to discard this one. Right. So I guess I have to hold this back, but it's clogging up my hand. Yeah. And then you have to think, okay, at the end game, though, even though she has all those all those purple trees, I have the seven here. So she's not going to be able to score that unless yeah. she has something really up her sleeve. So, it's really uh, tricky. Yeah, it is tricky. It's great at the full four because the, all the discard card piles are out there um mm -hmm. it does play well at all player counts i think my favorite though is four yeah so this is a very brain burny <laughs> card game uh if you haven't noticed we are very much so in the market for really thinky mm -hmm. card games because that's a it's really clever if you can design a card game that's that thinky totally yeah. so this is one of the heavier ones that we have in our collection also one of my favorite card games of all time so you might see it uh Somewhere. higher up on yeah. the list while we're on that topic, by the way, we're going to have a lot of crossovers. Totally, and yeah. when we get to them, we will let you know. I love this game as well. There you go. That is our freedom, number 49. Okay, my number 48 is also a card game. A lot of our card games are going to be here, In kind of like area. the first tier of our of our list. Maybe. Um, and it is a game that also has kind of a, a reprint, a re-theming. Uh, it's designed by Ko Kota Nakayama and uh, published by Emperor S4 in 2013. And it is one of my favorite two-player games of all time, actually. It's called Hanami Koji. Mm -hmm. So this is another game that we covered on our channel, uh, but we covered the the reprint, the retheming of it, called yeah. Jixi Academy. Jixi Academy, that's right. And that right. was published, or is published by Deepwater Games, but it's essentially the same game. This is a two-player-only card game where it's very thinky. You're trying to outthink your opponent. Um, there's a deck of cards, and they have different symbols on them that pertain to these geisha cards that we that would be uh, laid out in front of the table mm -hmm. and each geisha is assigned a value it's their charm points yes yeah they they rank from anywhere from uh, as little as two points up so to five points five points yeah. yeah essentially the way that it works is each player has four tokens that are the different actions that you can take you have a hand of cards to start the round players essentially take turns taking one of these four actions until all four actions of each player has been taken mm -hmm. and these are going to be things like uh, laying out three cards from your hand, allowing your opponent to choose one, and then you get to keep the other two. That's right. Yeah. And then uh, all cards that you keep get placed on your side of the geisha row. And at the end of the round, you're essentially trying to win over these geishas over to your favor, your side. Mm -hmm. And uh, you win the game if you can win at least I think it's 11 four points. of them. Four, I think four of the geishas yes. or a total of 11 charm points. Charm points, yeah. First, and if that if any of those conditions um, are met, then you win the game. And it's very thinky because you're trying to figure out, okay, what cards does my opponent have in their hand? Which mm -hmm. ones are they going to try to win? If you don't win in the first round, which is usually the case, then you go for another round and you're trying to win over the geishas that your opponent won. Yes. So, so there's a little bit of a defense portion. So if, if, if the game is not outright won in the first round, which hopefully it didn't happen because yeah. the, the, the real <laughs> thinkiness happens when you get into round two. Let's say Monique has, you know, eight points uh, total and yeah. I have maybe, you know, like six points and I'm desperate to hold on to the geishas that I've already already kind of attracted over to my side. So there's kind of a meta game where it's like, okay, I already have control of this one. So can I try to work and chip away at another one? Mm -hmm. Or uh, do I have to only protect these ones? Right. And so it gets very, very interesting in that. Uh, I will say in this game, you can try to card count, but it's one of those games where you pull one card out of the deck. Yes. And that one card that comes out of the deck that you don't know, 
that makes a huge like kind yes. of like uh, like oh my gosh this is maybe 50 50 <laughs> maybe a one in three shot that it's stuck in that in that discard yeah. pile you're definitely there. going to want a card count yeah like it's, it's the entire game is a meta game yeah so super interesting this is a game that we really love taking with us um on trips because it's just a, such a small box small footprint and yep. it's so quick and easy to take out and play but but uh so much brain juice going whenever yeah. you play this one this is a great game like if you go uh, to game night and maybe you show up 10 minutes late or 10 minutes early mm -hmm. and uh, other people are just wrapping up a game and they're like oh we need 15 minutes just pull this one out and uh, it's, it's a great game to kind of fill in that that little time space so that's by 48 hanami koji um, or dixie academy mm -hmm. whichever theme you prefer okay moving on my number 48 this is a game that came out back in 1997 designed by uve rosenberg and published by amigo and rio grande games and it is the infamous bonanza <laughs> Uh, oh I really gosh. like this game a lot. Uh, this is basically a bean farming game. Uh, there is an interesting aspect of this game where uh, you basically have two bean fields and there's different uh, bean varieties that you can plant in those bean fields. Uh, a bean field can only have one type of variety. And so at the very beginning of the game, you're going to have a hand of cards. And the thing that's very, very interesting and very important in this game is your, you cannot mix the cards that are in your hand. They mm -hmm. must remain where they are. So if I draw a card, it goes to the end of the pile, and I basically have this kind of conveyor belt going mm -hmm. on. So at the start of my turn, I must plant one of the cards in my hand into one of my bean fields. And so uh, there comes a point in time in the game where you have cards that you need to get out of your hand. So there's a negotiation aspect where it's like, I will give you a black bean <laughs> if you do x y and z and so oh uh, essentially what you're trying to do is you're trying to curate that that perfect hand that you have so you can lay down as many of the proper beans that you want in your field so you can eventually uh, harvest those beans to score the most amount of points or get the most amount of coins it's bean wheeling and dealing yeah, it is yes <laughs> this is definitely a game that Naveen loves so much. I think I like a lot of wheeling and dealing games. Oh, yeah. 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 He, you're all, he's all about the negotiation. I am, you know, in the yeah. beginning, it was all about Settlers of Catan. Yeah, and that's right. And then Matryoshka came around, and now Bonanza. That's it's right. all about the wheeling and dealing. With wheeling me. and dealing. I love player interaction. Uh, this game, it yeah. says 45 minutes on the box. I think that's about right. No that's way. The, so that, that this, seems right. I no. really love Bonanza as well, but not nearly as much as Naveen does. And yeah. the, the reason for me is because it does run long. You have to like go through the deck like two or three times or something. I think it's twice. But remember, a lot of people have scored points in that first. So yeah. the first time you go through the deck, it, yeah. it's longer than the second time because the cards that you score, you just flip them over to represent points. Mm -hmm. And so that deck is actually thinner by the time you go through the second time. So I, that, I think that's why you feel like it's going to be longer, but it's it actually is long. <laughs> yeah. Plays up to seven players, so there could be a yeah. lot of negotiation going on. Yeah, uh, the more the better. The more the especially better. Especially yeah. if you have like a really good group going, it's really it's really funny. It's a hilarious game. For me, I think the sweet spot is about five players. Mm. for this one yeah and while we're on the topic by the way of uh this is an uwe rosenberg game if you are following along with our uwe rosenberg series that we are going out at a crawl by the way <laughs> yeah. I, there may be some spoilers in our entire top 50 That's because right. we, we really do love uwe rosenberg yeah you'll know. and there are going to be a couple of titles that are going to make it on this list we will let you know in advance if there's going to be a spoiler so that you can choose to skip ahead if okay. you like. Yeah. And that is my number 48, Bonanza, to bean or not to bean. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on to number 47. This is a game that came out last year and actually one of my favorite games to come out um, from last year. It was designed by Kevin Russ and published by Flat Out Games and AEG, of course, in 2020. Mm -hmm. And it is a cute but crunchy game called Calico. We didn't know what to expect. When it, when it first arrived. No, um, I, I knew nothing kind of, about it when it came in. Yeah, I think it kind of showed up and we were like, okay, uh, Naveen wanted to delay discovering this game <laughs> actually did, because yeah. he was like, uh, we're dog people. First of all, yeah. Second of all, we, we didn't really know much about what the game was. I know when we I had first. I know I say it. I don't care about theme too much in, in in board gaming, but it's weird. Like a theme can can make like me springboard to be like, okay, let's play that one first amongst right. all the games. Yeah. Or let's hold that one back. Yeah. And so for some reason, like I know there's a lot of cat people out there. <laughs> I'm a big, I'm a I'm a dog person more so than a cat person. So that's why I I was like, ah, we can play that one later. And as beautiful as the artwork of Beth Sobel is as evidenced by the box. It was not enough to sway Naveen uh, to, to dig into it. And so we were seeing it around on social media. So I was like, 
I don't know, Naveen, I think we have to try this game. Yeah, yeah. And I'm so glad that we did because it is a wonderful brain burning tile laying game where you're building out a quilt for your cats. You're also yeah. trying to entice your cats, by the way, to come lay on your quilt, mm -hmm. I believe. Yeah, you are. And yeah. Uh, you desperately want to make the perfect combination of tiles on your quilt so that you can score the maximum number of points by the end of the game. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Let me know if you've ever played a perfect game of Calico because that's got to be statistically just, <laughs> very, nope. Very challenging. Not, yeah. not ever going to happen, yeah. but uh, you're going to try. And you're going to do your best, and it's not going to feel good when it doesn't happen, but that is the game of Calico. <laughs> yeah, eventually you, uh, the board's going to start getting filled out, and yeah. you're going to find yourself pigeonholed into like, all right, I, I can either score this one or this one, mm -hmm. and this one tile is perfect for both of them. And so if I put it here, it wastes it on the other side. If I put it there, it's not going to work for the other one. So, yes. yeah, it's a good game. Very, a, very good. Really, really good game. Yeah. Uh, Flat Out is also known for putting out games like this that are that are fairly thinky. Mm -hmm. The sort of follow up to this game was Cascadia this year, which I also really, really, really enjoyed. Mm -hmm. um, I like that a lot more for a broader audience, I yeah. guess. But this one just... I like the stress. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and this one really, really brings the stress. Yeah. And so that is my number 47, the super stressful Calico. Okay, my number 47. This is a game that came out back in 2014, designed by Mark Andre and published by Space Cowboys. And this is the ultimate uh, gateway game okay. for me to get me into the hobby, and that is Splendor. Uh, I know a lot of people criticize Splendor yeah. for, for <laughs> not being a board game. I don't know why it's a game. Uh, you are basically collecting gems to try to uh, get different cards that also encompass gems on them so that you can kind of build up a gem economy mm -hmm. so you can try to score the most amount of points. Uh, the goal is to get to 15 points total uh, and it's essentially a race to that. Everybody gets the same amount of turns and whoever has the most amount of points at the end of the game wins. Um, I like it because um, you can play offense and defense at the mm -hmm. same time in this game. I can see, oh, Monique has been collecting a lot of blue gems. What out there in the display has a lot of blue gems? Okay, I can, I can snag this card away and maybe work towards it because, uh, you know, I don't want her to score the points. Yeah. Uh, it scales very well uh, at all player counts. I, I, for me, there's no specific player count that I find uh, the most um, mesmerizing or most... Mesmerizing. <laughs> wow. The gems. Yeah. The gems really the gems, got you there. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, I'm surprised that this yeah. is not higher on your list, seeing mm -hmm. as Naveen is a tournament master of Splendor. Yeah. He, he one won tournament. the the player mat, which is probably... Play mat. That was the, the grand prize. Yeah, the grand tournament. prize. You're yes. probably going to see it in the B-roll photos that we took. Just to let you know, it does not come with a game. You right, have to be right. a tournament master, a tournament winner to get that. <laughs> I'm pretty sure was. you can buy it. Yeah. Um, I also really, really love this game. This is actually higher on my list, which you will see. And that's what makes me even more surprised that this is lower on your list than it is on mine. But uh, okay. I agree with, with I mean, there are a lot of people out there who don't like Splendor, which is totally fine. You know, these lists are, are highly subjective and it really just depends on where you are in the hobby, when you play the game, yep. you know, what kind of was going on in your brain. And uh, for us, this was like really early on in the hobby and it's just a fun game. It's just fun to think through for me. Yeah. You're, you're trying to one up your opponents while also getting the cards that will give you more gems to use mm -hmm. in the future so that you can just win the game as fast as possible because it's a giant race. Yeah, sometimes right? like I'll go for the heavy hitter four and five point cards if I can if I see an opportunity for them. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you'll find yourself just, just kind of squeaking out those quick little uh, cards, the, the small value ones, so you can build up an economy so mm -hmm. you don't really have to rely so much on the gem the tokens gems that you're, yeah, uh, and more on gems. your cards, exactly, yeah. And so for True. me, I, I really, really <laughs> enjoy the fact that you have to be both offensive and defense to be successful in this game. And so that is my number 47 the ultimate gateway game for me that is splendor okay so my number 46 is a game that i don't think has made it onto any of our lists in the past okay maybe not sure. uh, it's designed by bruno cathala and as well as charles chevalier mm -hmm. in 2016 and published by aiello it is a game called kanagawa so this is another one of my favorite kind of a end piece games uh -huh. at game night i like to either start with it or or you know when it's like you know we, we have like we can play another game in 40, 30, mm -hmm. 45 minutes. Yep. Kanagawa, it's Kanagawa. so perfect. Yeah. Easy to and teach. It's easy to teach. Yeah. It's essentially a set collection game, kind of. Kind of, yeah. Um, what you have here is, you're, I guess the theme is you're at a school, like an art school. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's this mat that's laid out in the middle of the table and uh, cards that are going to be laid out onto the mat each round. And the cards are going to have different things on them, like uh, combinations of trees, animals. different types of people, animals. And so each round, one layer of cards is going to be laid out, depending on player count. Mm -hmm. And each person goes around one by one, uh, basically saying if you're going to stay in school or if you're going to drop out. Right. 
And uh, if you decide to drop out, then you take an entire column of cards. For everybody who decides to stay in, you lay out another round of cards on that mat up to a maximum of three times. And so if you stay in until the very end of a round, then you get three cards because yes. you take an entire column of cards. And those cards get added to your playing area, either uh, to your studio, which is the bottom half of your tableau, and the studio will, will basically allow you to paint more things because yes, you're painting a big mural. It, it kind of soups up your ability to do more things. Yes. And then the other side is kind of what you're actually painting. What you're scoring, so you're yeah. To score, yeah. And uh, the game ends once somebody has like a total of 13, I think, cards, cards. In, their, in their painting. That's right. And then you're going to score for different things. You're going, you're going to score for the longest uninterrupted line of season symbols. Uh, there are different scoring uh, tokens, which you're going to be competing for throughout the, the game, mm -hmm. like uh, having three different types of people in your painting or right. having a certain number of trees, that kind of thing. A certain combination of animals mm -hmm. that you have in your painted section. Right. Yeah. And so just that whole part where everybody's kind of going around the table debating when to drop out mm -hmm. is super interesting. You know, that part's really yeah. interesting because you're kind of, it's that's the meta game. You're trying to get into each other's heads like, do I need to drop out now? Because there is that one card that I really, really need in yeah. order to score this, in order to take that that scoring token, right? Yeah, because the cards are multi-purpose, so mm -hmm. it's like, oh man, that that I need to be able to paint the the green symbol, and mm -hmm. I have none in my like school the bottom right. section. Yeah. And ooh, and also in that same column, it's gonna keep my winter weather going. So, mm -hmm. all right, fine, I'm gonna drop out super early because those two cards are gonna be perfect for me. Mm -hmm. But then now you're out, and then your opponents are basically having a free flow of all the new cards that are coming out. Right. And so that kind of decision point as to like when to, to stay in and when to drop out is, is really fun. Just a fun, beautiful game. It is, right? yeah. So that is the number 46, Kanagawa. Okay, my number 46. This is a game that we've actually covered on our channel back in uh, 2020 when it first came out. It is designed by Steven Aramini and published by Galactic Raptor Games. And it is an area control card game called Animal Kingdoms. Uh, this one I was very pleasantly surprised. It plays mm -hmm. uh, one to five players, never played it solo, and it scales perfectly at all player counts. Mm -hmm. Like I have, mm -hmm. I've never seen yeah, a game uh, that was so kind of restrictive that I thought that you know a five player game of this would not be very good. But no, it plays really, really well at all player counts. Mm -hmm. Essentially, what you're doing is there is a board um, with different pie slices, basically. <laughs> I don't know how to describe There's this. There's a board like with different a, uh, different sections yes. that are sectioned off that are the different kingdoms, kingdoms in this right. animal okay, kingdom. And go. you're essentially <laughs> trying to get an uh, area majority. That's it's right. an area control game. I really don't like area control games, but I really like this one because mm -hmm. there's a hand management aspect to it with beautifully illustrated cards, by the way. Yep. And uh, you're basically trying to one-up your opponents by playing these cards in each kingdom, mm -hmm. and each kingdom has a different scoring uh, condition that's going to change from round to round. Right, right. So it's going to be either like... like uh, all odd cards can only be played right, here. Or, or only these types of animal Animal species can be played in this section and sometimes the the type of card that you can play is going to be dependent on other areas of the kingdom yep. or the last card that your opponents have played and so it's just really it's really fun it is fun it's, really it's, it's, it's interesting uh because you start to try to card count as much as you can mm -hmm. uh there is an area control obviously aspect because you're trying to uh score points uh, in these different um kingdoms mm -hmm. and only one person gets to keep their uh, kind of scoring marker from each kingdom from round to round. So yes, you get a seat at the council. You get a seat at the council, exactly. <laughs> the meaning animal like, council. Meaning it, you know, it's a three round game. So if Monique wins a very favorable kingdom early, then I'm like, okay, I need to make sure that I, I one up her as many times as I can in round two and three so that she just doesn't get all these points kind of passively. So uh, And at the at the end of each round there's kind of like a if there's a tie in the kingdoms, you go into this kind of battle, like a yes. standoff it's battle. It's kind of like war. Yeah. It has to do with the cards that you left in your hands. So there's yeah. a little bit of that, a little bit of withholding. The, the hand management is really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. So if, if we were to make a list, by the way, of like top 10 hidden gems, this would definitely this would be, be on, it. Yeah. on my list for sure. Totally. It's, it's not in my top 50. Um, I kind of regret that because it, it is a really fun game. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's a great choice. Yeah, really, really good. And it's a thin box. Look at that. Yeah, like really it. thin. Yep. So that is my uh, number 46, Animal Kingdoms. Okay, moving on to number 45. We are halfway through with mm -hmm. our first 10 leg. Yes. The top 50. So many games. <laughs> Uh, so this one is our first one with a disclosure. In the past, we have been sponsored to do a gameplay of a version of this game on Watch It Played. Mm -hmm. So please keep that in mind. We are not here to sway you one way or the other, sure. but it does belong on my list. And so this is a game that was um, designed by Prospero Hall and published by Ravensburger in 2018. You may already know what it is. Mm. It is Disney Villainous. So uh, 
if you're not familiar with this game, this is a highly asymmetric game where you are playing as the villains, different villains. There are a lot of different expansions mm -hmm. to this game, so it really just depends on which one you have, and they're all standalone. But the, the basic concept is you are a villain in one of the Disney movies, mm -hmm. and you're trying to be the best villain. Right, right. <laughs> you're trying to outcompete the other villains. And essentially, the way that the game works is each person has their own uh, thematic tableau, yep. as well as their own asymmetric end game um, win, win objective, condition, yeah. win condition that is yeah. specific to the theme of your villain. And over the course of the game, you're basically just moving through the different areas of their of your board taking actions that are on that specific location yeah and it's kind of like an action selection worker placement yeah, kind of game yeah definitely. where you're, you're moving your your villain pawn to take certain types of actions mm -hmm. yeah. and you're, you're going to be doing things like playing cards from your hand you're going to be fading people which is essentially uh, cursing them you're going to be drawing cards from the fate deck and putting them on their tableau to cover up yes. action spaces and locations yep. and then they're going to have to play uh, allies to that location in order to defeat those those heroes. And I really, really like it because I'm a huge fan of asymmetry. And uh, this one has it, I mean, the, the whole thing about this game is the asymmetric uh, bit of it. Mm -hmm. And I think that it does it really well. I will say, though, that uh, there are a couple of caveats. Um, I definitely like the Marvel system better mm -hmm. than the Disney one. And the Marvel uh, villainous game is the one that we were uh, sponsored to play on Watch It Played. Yep. Uh, but I do like the way that that one works a little bit better. But I like the theme of the Disney ones better. Mm -hmm. I also only like to play this game at two or three. Yeah, I, I think don't... three is a nice. Yeah. Number. Yeah. And I really just love the production value of it. The, I'm a big Disney fan. You know, we grew up watching Disney movies mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And so just discovering the thematic integration of the um, end goal objectives and just the different uh, cards and just the look of all the pieces of the game. And there are a lot of different expansions and each expansion comes with a different combination of villains. Mm -hmm. And so if you're looking for specific villains, you can just get the expansion box. You don't have to get the main one because they're all standalone. Yes, they're all standalone. That's right. And so that is my number 45, Disney Villainous. Okay, my number 45. This is a game that came out in 2016. It is designed by two different designers, Tom Jolly and Luke Laurie, and published by Minion Games. Uh, and it's a standalone second uh, type of game in, in this genre, and it is Manhattan Project Energy Empire, <laughs> uh, because there is a Manhattan Project game, which I actually have never played. That came out back in 2012, from I what I understand. I think there are a few versions. Yeah. We, this is the only one that this we've played. This is the only one I've played. entire series. And I've also heard that this is the best of them from other people. I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Uh, this one plays one to five players in about roughly one to two hours. And essentially what you're doing is it is a... Uh, futuristic, I guess uh, it's the, the nuclear age, and we are different uh, countries uh, that are mm -hmm. trying to build up our systems for basically producing energy. We want to save the world. We want to save the world. We're thinking in terms of environmentalists, and we want to clean up pollution on yes. our main boards. In this game, you do basically one of two things. You either place out workers and take actions, or you recall your workers and actually produce energy. Mm -hmm. uh, energy is produced in uh, various different types of dice. There is dirtier energy, like coal, mm -hmm. all the way up to nuclear energy. So there's like wind, uh, solar, I think, uh, coal. Yeah, and the yeah. board is divided into three different sections. So yep. the main point of it is you're going to be going to these different sections of the board to build these cards. Mm -hmm. And the cards kind of build up your tableau because they become like your own personal uh, engine that, mm -hmm. that only you can tap into and they'll like your own little worker placement spots. Yep. Uh, and so the, the cards are going to be a big part of the game because they're giving you combinations of resources that you can now use in the future to build up more cards or to gain more of these dice that Naveen was talking about. Yep. Some dice gives you more energy than others, but also come at a cost because they add more pollution to your board. And you're essentially using the energy in order to take action spots that other players are already in. Yeah, exactly. It's an excellent game. Mm -hmm. I really, really like this game as well. The only thing is it doesn't really... I remember it not really scaling well no, at uh, yeah. two, specifically two players. Exactly. And so the timer of the game doesn't scale well at two. It makes the mm -hmm. game kind of long and it makes you feel like now the, the tension is not as high. As high, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I feel like uh, maybe they, they, there could be now in the mo in you know 2021, somebody can come up with maybe maybe there's like a house rule of how to make the two player game a little sweeter. Uh, the four player game, uh, I feel like you didn't have enough turns uh, because <laughs> it, it just kind of goes really okay. fast. So there's a scaling issue, yeah. but the actual game itself is fantastic. Yeah. So that is my number 45. That is Manhattan Project Energy Empire. Okay, so moving on to number 44. This is a game that we've covered on our channel previously, and uh, it's designed by Inca and Marcus Brand in 2017 mm -hmm. and published by r, &R Games. And it is probably one of my favorite uh, games that feature dice. Mm -hmm. We're not really mm -hmm. dice people. 
but it is called Rajas of the Ganges. Yeah. So this game is, is for me, it has a lot of fun factor. Mm -hmm. um, if you've caught the video that we did, the playthrough of it, uh, we did mention in there that it's one of those games that we don't play all the time. You know, it's a game that we like to come back to, yeah. and every time we come back to it, it feels fresh. It just does, because yeah. You're building out palace grounds on your main uh, player board by purchasing these tiles. And in order to purchase those tiles, you need certain combinations of dice mm -hmm. that add up to their value. But it's a lot of just wheeling and dealing of dice. Yeah. Like, there are, it's a technically a worker placement game at its heart, mm -hmm. but uh, the worker placement spots are just going to get you more dice or more combinations of dice. Like, you can go to one area that lets you turn in a blue die for two of a different color different die. Color, yeah. uh, there's also these high council members that you can go to depending on which die a number you rolled and it's essentially a race too because and it's essentially a race and yeah. that is the part of it that i felt was very unique because over the course of the game you're going to be scoring two different types of points i guess you're going to mm -hmm. be scoring fame as well as money but essentially they're found on both sides of the board and as soon as your markers cross each other then the game ends yep. and whoever is the first to be able to intersect their fame and their money wins the game and so that concept, um, I remember the first time you told me about it, we were mm -hmm. at a convention and you're like, yeah, it's it's weird. The, yeah. the way that the, the game ends is when you intersect these scoring the conditions. Two different I was like, yeah. what? <laughs> I couldn't understand that concept. Yeah, yeah. I've never heard of it before. It's a fantastic game. Yeah, uh, it's really, really good. Uh, there is a advanced side of the board that you can play, uh, mm -hmm. you, so which uh, you can kind of tailor and kind of change up some of the uh, the bonus scoring mm -hmm. on there. Yeah. Uh, I believe there is like mini expansions, which we have still not uh, messed around with. I know, we yeah. really need to. We do have some of them, but we just have not included them in the game because like we said, we play it once every uh, every couple months. Yeah, every couple months. So um, it always feels fresh when we just take it out for mm -hmm. that first time. But yeah, I really enjoy this one as well. Um, I like the fact that uh, you can get more worker meeples to take more action so there's kind of a race to to get as many of your meeples uh, so that you can take as many actions as possible yes uh, you can move up the sure. river you can um you know kind of uh build out your your palace and try to get an economy going mm -hmm. uh so there's a good amount going on there but like you said there is uh sometimes there's some clear strategies that you definitely need to do and now it's just about out outwitting your opponent to yeah. get to them first and so that is my number 44 rajas of the ganges Okay, my number 44, this is another card game. Uh, this is designed by Stefan Alexander and published by Catch Up Games back in 2018. Monique and I came into this game uh, when we were at Essen, and it is called q -Birds. He uh, loves this game so much. I love so this much. game. I think I've talked about this. Uh, I can't remember what other video. Oh, my gosh. Every video. Uh, yeah, he talks about yeah. this every video. Uh, essentially, what you're trying to do is you're trying to do a set collection of different bird species. Uh, the art is super adorable in this game. All the birds are in this cube kind of block uh, look. Yeah. I love that. And so uh, there is a uh, display of different birds and you're basically trying to move certain bird cards into that display so you can then take uh, different birds uh, into your hand. You play so, you play a bird from your card, yeah. from your hand into the display. You're yes. going to sandwich the same type of bird because yes. you get to take all the, all birds, the birds in between, in between. Them. Yeah. So that you're trying to create a flock. It's set collection. Set collection. But yeah, it's one of my favorite uh, little card games. Um, and I don't know, I just have a, a kind of special connection with this because of uh, <laughs> my experience getting this at Essen. Yeah. A lot of these games are going to be on our list because of the feelings that they invoke. And I'm sure you, you can relate in some somewhere or the other. Mm -hmm. And this one just invokes some really... Really good feelings for Naveen. Yeah, it plays so. two to five players. I always like card games that can play well at the full complement of five players, mm -hmm. and this is no exception. So that is my number 44. This is uh, Q-Birds. All right, moving into our last leg of this video uh, to number 43. This is one of my favorite gateway games, mm -hmm. I guess. I guess it's considered a gateway game. There's a lot of strategy in this one. There's a lot of strategy in this yeah. one. So it's one of the heavier of the gateway games. Yeah. Um, it's designed by Bruno Cathala and published by Days of Wonder in 2014. It's called Five Tribes, the Jinns mm -hmm. of Nicola, I think. The way that it works is there is a five by six uh, board made out of tiles and uh, there are different colored meeples and that, that are placed onto the board. And if you ever played a game called Mancala, which is a game that I played a lot mm -hmm. growing up, in Filipino we have a game called Sunka, it's very similar. And you're essentially just taking one cluster of meeples from one of the tiles and you have to uh, create a path dropping one meeple off one at a time. And the very last colored meeple that you have is the kind of action that you get right, to take. Right. And the different colors pertain to the different types of actions. So some meeples will allow you to take some cards, some some meeples will allow you to score points depending on the tile, some will allow you to activate the bonus on the mm -hmm. tile, I think. I might be explaining that wrong. It's yeah. been a long time since I played this. I, yeah, I've played this several times, but I cannot remember it for some reason. Yeah, I yeah. will say that this, I believe this is a game that was uh, very controversial when it first came out mm -hmm. because of their choice of cards that they have since 
removed and replaced. But uh, the gameplay itself is is really interesting to me, or it, it has stood the test of time for yeah, me. Yeah. It can cause a lot of analysis paralysis because you're sitting there thinking, which cluster, how many tiles am I going to go around? Which which specific color mm -hmm. do I need? Um, there are ways for you to take multiple turns, I think, if yeah. you really plan your path right. And the AP can really build because uh, as you get a little deeper into the game, you're realizing that by the choices you make, you're setting up your opponents to take really sweet actions. Yes. And so that can start to create a lot of AP where it's like, well, if I'm just one track mind thinking about myself, and you're not focusing on what other people have the ability to do, mm -hmm. uh, then you're basically going to give the game away. So, mm -hmm. uh, so then, then you start thinking about like, okay, I don't know what's the best thing for me. Do I want to get something really good for me, or do I just want to avoid them getting something really, really right, good? Right, right, right. Yeah. And there's definitely a, a mechanism mm -hmm. in there that dictates. Um, I believe you have to bid for turn order, mm -hmm. and turn order is a big deal. Yes. Right. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. one of those games where you definitely want to go as early as possible, or maybe not. Maybe you see a certain combination of things that you just want somebody else to move. For. To force you, you to, so yeah. that you can uh -huh. now take. Yeah, this is one of the oldest games that we have in our collection in terms of when we acquired them, yes. in terms of when they've been designed. Right. But uh, for that, I think it would it's going to stay in our collection for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And that is my number 43, Five Tribes. Okay, my number 43, this is a game that we do not possess. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. I, yeah, I want this game, but no box to show you. Uh, it's designed by Reiner Knizia back in 1999. It's an auction uh, game, pure auction game. Uh, published by Windrider Games. It's actually been published by a lot of different people, but the most recent one, Windrider Games in 2016. And it is a game called Raw, which is right here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I don't have the box here, but it's... it's we also will not have any B-roll, by the way. For yes. Games that we don't own. Exactly. Because we can't take pictures of them. Yeah, and th so this game is purely an auction game. Uh, essentially, it is a Egyptian-themed auction game in which players are going to be competing for the most points, like most games. Uh, and essentially, what you're going to be doing is on your turn, you can either um, draw tiles out of a bag, uh, and these different tiles have different scoring parameters on them. Some tiles uh, that you acquire in the auction will score at the end of the round or end of the epoch. There are three epochs in this game. Or some will you will be uh, claiming during the course of the game Game, but only scoring at the very end of the game. So there's kind of this like, oh man, do I want to get these tiles early so that I can build up towards a nice end game scoring, or do I want to get these end of round scorings and just kind of chip away that way? Uh, it's really, really cool because mm -hmm. um, you start with these three different uh, sun dial um, tokens, and essentially what they do is they, uh, they are your currency for bidding. Mm -hmm. So at the very uh, beginning of a round, there is going to be one of these tokens in the dead center, and they're numbered, I think, like 1 through 15 or something. And so when you win an auction, you have to pay out one of your sun uh, sundials. That one that you used to uh, bid is going to be the new one that comes into the center. So not only are people getting the, the new tiles that are going to come out, but mm -hmm. if you put out a big heavy hitter, everybody's going to want to compete for that so that they can use that tile in the next epoch mm -hmm. to then buy better uh, uh, different uh, tiles when they come out of the bag. There is also a kind of a push your luck aspect of this game. So if enough uh, certain tiles come out, uh, it'll trigger the exact end of the round. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of weigh your timing as to like, OK, can I afford to keep pressing my luck and putting more tiles out there? So uh, when I do win an auction, I can take sweeter tiles back to you. So there's a good kind of like teeter totter as to like what you're trying to do in this game. And uh, it, I love auction games and I think it's really, really fantastic. I've only played this game once and it was like years ago. So I don't really remember um, how to play it. Now that you're describing it, it's kind of coming back mm -hmm. to me. Um, I remember thinking it was very clever, as most of Dr. Reiner Knizia's games are. Mm -hmm. He's very, very prolific, and uh, he's a genius. Yep. Yeah, I'm yeah. saying it. There's also an iOS app, which I do play pretty frequently. Uh, so if yeah, I think it's still available. So if you are interested in checking out the game, uh, you can always check out the app first and seeing if you do like it when the eventual reprint does come out. Nice. And that is my number 43, Raw. All right, last two games of our list. Moving on to number 42. Mm -hmm. This is another card game. <laughs> so all of my card games are here in like the first 10 of the You got quite a bit there, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, I really like card games. Um, and I really like two-player card games. So this is a game that is also designed by Dr. Reiner Knizia. Wow, I, we, didn't, we did not coordinate that. No. Um, and it's also published by Aiello in 1999. There are different iterations of this game, but the one that I am talking about is a card game called Shot and Totten. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, this game is is a re-implementation of a previous game called Battle Line, Battle Line yeah. and I believe that was also a re-implementation of a game called The Fifth Column, and these are all games designed by Ryder Knizia. I believe The Fifth Column can be used with a standard playing deck. We've mm. never played that version. We've mm. only ever played Shot and Totten. I really like this game because it is um, all about playing poker hands. Mm -hmm. You know, you have these uh, this array of stones <laughs> that are laid out in a line in, in the middle of the table. Mm -hmm. Each player has their own hand of cards, and they're numbered, <laughs> but you're playing your cards to your side of the stones, trying to win each stone uh, using a combination of poker hands. There's a hierarchy, just like in poker, yep. of, of three card hands yep. that are going to be better than the other. And your goal is to, I believe, win four stones? I think it's win five total oh. or three in a row. Or three in a row. It gets really interesting when you're trying to card count and you're, you're trying to figure out a uh, how you can one up your opponent, mm -hmm. and as you know, at the beginning of the game, you're kind of playing cards like I don't know what kind of poker hands I'm going to build. I have yeah. uh, some idea as to which ones I may want to build in the future, which ones to hold back in my hand, but you don't really know where your your opponent's going to be playing out their yeah. hand. But as you get further and further into the game, it gets more intense because you're like running out of options. You to, have to play a play. card on your turn, so yeah, you, you have to. So eventually, like if you left some stones un unattended to mm -hmm. for the flexibility, eventually you're like, I have to play a card and once you play a card somewhere it, that's where it is it, mm -hmm. it stays there and so yeah. if like i'm like i i really know i want to get a set here or like a three at three of a kind right. in this area i haven't seen that other seven that i'm really looking forward to yeah. and like i only have two of them so i guess i'm just going to start playing them here and hopefully i can draw that seven eventually yeah, yeah. so yeah. It, it's really really fascinating it's, it's fascinating yeah. it's, it's definitely a meta game you're it's just like hanuma koji is to me this is a little bit more of a looser longer game mm -hmm. but uh with a lot of fun factor if you don't like just playing the base game that it also comes with these extra power cards that you yeah. can put into play it definitely makes the game more chaotic and a little bit more up to chance for that reason we don't usually play with the power cards we, we like it the base. just the base game yeah. but this game is definitely a game that we like to take with us when we travel mm -hmm. and so that is my number 42 shot and totten which will probably never leave our collection yeah i'm saying that right That's now pretty good mm -hmm. okay my number 42 this is a game that uh, we've actually covered on the channel we did a playthrough of it uh, it was designed back in 20 2014, designed by Matisse Cotri and published by CGE. And this one is a very, very good game that requires an app to use if you really want to have the full experience. And it is Alchemist. Yes. Uh, this is a scientific method deduction game, uh, yeah. but it is a worker placement <laughs> exactly. game essentially where you mm -hmm. are trying to uh, figure out various combinations of uh, potions by um, testing these different ingredients. You're trying to test them on yourself, on your students, uh, and you are trying to be as correct as possible because mm -hmm. eventually you're going to try to publish these theories uh, when you get to the end of the round and you're trying to score the most amount of points in this game. Right. You're essentially uh, trying to figure out the DNA of the different, I think there are eight different eight, alchemical yeah. tokens, uh -huh. and the tokens have different uh, combinations of symbols. You have a you have a player sheet, think yeah. Clue, right? Yeah. When you play Clue, you have a sheet that you're trying to like X out things because there's a huge deduction component to Big this. Time, yeah. And you're trying to figure out which ingredients correspond to the different alchemical tokens. Yeah. And then uh -huh. when you figure that out, you want to publish that theory. But there's a lot of meta game to it. It's, it's definitely a worker placement game, but you can on purpose publish the wrong theory so yeah. that you can lead your opponents astray because a lot of the times you're not going to figure out every single one on your own. Yeah, because gonna... by, the, by the end of certain rounds, you are required to have uh, published a theory. Or you get docked. Or you get docked points. Yeah. So everybody's going to kind of race to kind of guess as to yeah, what yeah. they... they... Some, a lot of times you'll come down to a 50-50 guess, but there's a way to hedge against your own guess. But you're leading other people to be like, does Monique know <laughs> that? Because if yeah. she does know that, then I can use a little bit of that information to yeah, really to help use, me right. deduce what I need to know. And so at, at some point, you're probably going to have to rely on your opponent's information. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Usually. And so if you're, you know, people who have played the game, have more experience with it, will sometimes publish the wrong theory so they can debunk their own theory and yeah. then publish the proper one later on to right. score more points. Right. And that can lead people down a path that just ruins their whole sheet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So so it, it gets pretty uh, pretty funny uh, towards mm -hmm. like the, the latter, like 20, 25% of the game yeah. where people start debunking and then like other people, you're just like, oh no, yeah. I thought I knew. <laughs> You know, Funny. so it is a it's a really fascinating game. Uh, it does require an app to play. No, it. for the record, it does not. Oh. Um, you can have a you can have a player who doesn't play the game. I know this this sounds like really. That's why it requires an app. You can have somebody who's maybe just like a family member in the house who can set it all for you uh -huh. before you play it, and then unfortunately that player would have to be there the entire time to tell you it 
to tell you the answers that the app would just give you. But if yeah. you are willing to use an app, <laughs> the app makes things a hundred million times easier. Yeah. Um, and Play with it, the app. It, it works really well. It is a very so. good app. And uh, that is my number 42. That is Alchemist. And so here we are now at the end of our first top 50 video. Mm -hmm. We're at number 41. Uh, my number 41 is designed by Matthew O'Malley and Ben Rossett and published by Renegade Games in 2020. It is a game that is in and out of stock. Uh, you know, last, awesome. this time last year, nobody could get it, yeah. including us. <laughs> we really yeah. wanted this game wanted yeah. a year ago. We finally have it. And it is called The Search for Planet X. If you like deduction games, this yes. is the holy grail of deduction games, in my opinion. Pure deduction Right game. now, yeah. in where we are in the hobby mm -hmm. this year, this is the deduction game. And that is why it is on my top 50 list, because I really enjoy deduction games. So the main concept is there is a, a large board in the middle of the table that has a, a certain number of kind segments. Of pie depending, slices, like yeah, making up a whole circle. Depending yeah. on which level of difficulty you play or which length, because one side has less, the other side has more. Mm -hmm. And each player has their own sheet as well. And you're basically trying to find Planet X. And there are a lot of other um, celestial bodies in the sky, yep. and they all have different types of uh, re of conditions, like like comets. They are within a band of like uh, six different pie slices. I, I I don't remember the exact. Rules. I think they're dwarf planets. Dwarf planets, yeah. yeah. So there are different celestial bodies, and they have different rules, the, and that'll yeah. help you figure out where they are. Right. And uh, so this is a, this is another game that requires an app. This one truly requires one mm -hmm. because you're basically going to um, be asking the app where certain things are mm -hmm. uh, in in a a certain range of segments mm -hmm. on the map and so if i were to to uh, type in maybe like a seven leg segment and say how many dwarf planets are in here it'll just tell me how many there are right. in that segment it won't tell me where and so it's my job to try to figure out where all the celestial bodies are so that Based i can find where planet x yeah is. based off of the rules of the different celestial bodies mm -hmm. because uh the, the thing that we didn't mention is only one type of celestial body can fit in every single pie slice yes so if i know right. a comet is in number 17 planet x cannot be there right also every time you take an action uh, you have kind of like this pawn piece that's going to move around mm -hmm. and that's going to dictate uh, basically turn order so sometimes you can take something that's very specific but it's going to force you all the way out uh, in front of your opponents meaning whoever's behind is going to take actions until they kind of leapfrog you. Yeah, it's essentially, depending on how many segments you're searching, the, the fewer segments you search, the more information you have, right? right? So it costs more time. Mm -hmm. And so the further out you are in the board, the less actions you're going to be able to take because the way that the turn order works is whoever is furthest behind gets to go next. Mm -hmm. So you want to take as little time as possible to figure this, these things out. You score points depending on which theories you're able to publish. There's a, there's a little bit more to the game than this, mm -hmm. but that is the basic concept. The game ends when somebody is able to find um, Planet X, but it's not enough for you to know where Planet X is. You also have to know what's in the bordering segments. Yes. And the thing that I like about it is um, you don't have to find Planet X in order to win. No, no. You know, there are various ways mm -hmm. to score points in the game, and uh, it definitely gives you a lot of points to find Planet X, but it doesn't necessarily give you the win. And we played several games where the player who found Planet X did not win the game. There's also ways for you to scale the game in terms mm -hmm. of difficulty. So if I'm a, a more experienced player, right, we've played it several times now, and we're playing it with somebody who's played it for the first time, before you start the game, you determine the difficulty that each player is going to embark yeah. upon, and that'll determine how many starting hints you get. Right. Um, I will say that it's not, this is like the most anti-party game. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's very, uh, very few player interaction besides trying to figure out the, the habits of guessing that your opponents are doing, which mm -hmm. is really hard to do, by the way. Mm -hmm. But um, if you enjoy deduction games and you don't mind that aspect of it being a more kind of heads down in your own paper kind of game, this is an excellent, excellent game. Mm -hmm. So that is my number 41, The Search for Planet X. Okay, my number 41, the last one on our list. This is a game that I do not currently own uh, in a physical copy, but I do have the digital or app version of it. It's uh, published by Schmitzbiel and designed by Wolfgang Warsh. And it is published back in 2018, and it's a game called Ganshan Clever, a.k.a. That's Pretty Clever uh, here in the U.S. Mm. And essentially, this is a roll-and-write game uh, where you are trying to score in different parameters. Um, you basically roll the dice, and amongst the six different colored dice, uh, those correspond with the different parameters where you can kind of make these uh, check marks. Uh, it is a, like I said, a roll-and-write game where you are trying to be as efficient as possible by taking the most efficient turns, I guess, by selecting certain dice yeah. and making different combinations of uh, kind of horizontal lines and rows. <laughs> it's kind of hard to it's explain kind of because hard to explain. of the lack of thematic integration, yes, I think. Yes, there's it's, no theme in this game at all. It's pretty much a bare-bones roll-and-write yes. that just has different 
boxes that score for different parameters. Different colors, yeah, and exactly. each time, I think the multiplayer version of it is like you, you roll the dice, and then uh, the die that you choose, everybody else also has to use, has to use something yeah. like that. Yeah, but I've I, actually only played the app. I played, yeah. I played the multiplayer one time several years ago, but I do not remember how to play it. I've only played the app. Mm -hmm. And um, essentially what you're trying to do is you're just trying to score the most amount of points. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a total efficiency game. Yeah. Like you're, you're trying to mathematically just score the highest number of points based off of the different combos that you can score yes. in the different boxes. If you're curious about the game, the app is fantastic. It is fantastic, So yeah. I, you know, it's really hard to explain the different parameters without going into specific details. Yeah. So I highly suggest you just check, check out the app. Yeah. Yeah, the, but, what's what's very satisfying in the game is as you get to kind of the mid game, uh, certain parameters start to get closed in on, mm -hmm. and so uh, certain things can can bleed into the other segments. So like if I finish off a row here, that'll get me a bonus, which I can then put into a different section, mm -hmm. which completes that row, which then gets spit out into another section. So it's kind of nice you get these like little kind of uh, benefits yeah. that kind of get popping off like it fireworks. Def definitely feeds into your feet your uh, positive feedback loop yes, that yes. humans enjoy. Uh -huh. you know, that kind of that, that addicting kind of gameplay. I have played the multiplayer version of the game. It's fun, but I don't think it's nearly as addicting as the one player game on the app. You know, that's just something you're, you're on a plane or something, mm -hmm. or you're just, you just need to pass some time. You just pull out the app and suddenly you've played eight games. <laughs> yes, like, yeah. You're just like playing, like, I gotta try to beat that score. Yeah. What's your highest score to beat? I'm gonna try to beat uh, it. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. just keep on going and exactly. going. Exactly, right? yeah. So that is uh, my number 41. That is Ganshan Clever. And that is it for our uh, first video of our top 50. That is a 41 through 50. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, as promised, we do have a giveaway. And in hindsight, Naveen should have gone first in this because our giveaway is based off of the game that is highest on our list mm -hmm. for that video. And that's going to be for the game that I chose this time. Yep. Uh, today's giveaway is for two copies of the Search for Planet X that has been generously donated by Renegade Games. So thank you so much to Renegade for sponsoring this giveaway. Mm -hmm. um, like we were mentioning, all the details of the giveaway are going to be in the description below, including which countries they are not able to ship to, unfortunately. Yep. What we want to do, though, is if you are following along with our Top 50 videos, please, we would love to follow along with yours as well. Mm -hmm. So if you have a Top 50, or if you'd like to just make one and, and <laughs> share which ones they are, please leave your 41 through 50 in the, the in the uh, comment section below because we would love to know what everybody is ranking as their top 50 as well well thank you so much for watching the video we hope you enjoyed it if you do want to follow along and see all the other videos that are going to be part of this series the next 40 games feel free to subscribe you can also hit the notification so you know when we release the next video and again feel free to check out the link in the description for all the details for the giveaway thank you bye, bye.